Hello, everyone. Welcome to this health equity um, speaker series. We're so pleased to have you here today. We are going to have a presentation tonight, which I'm very excited about. This webinar will feature Alexandra Elvira Samaran Lang Longorero. No, I've got to say it right. Longorio uh, and Carmen Lita Chief. They are the core co or core core leads and really organizers of this Fairness First campaign. And I think you're going to be very excited about it. It's a communication initiative, and it's funded by the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaboration at Northern Arizona University. Oh, and there it is. So we are going to be um, looking at the overview of FFC, Fairness First Campaign. And uh, we are really going to talk a little bit about the goals, the service audience, the activities, and also outcomes, impacts, and successes that they've had with this program, as well as some of the challenges, because there, there are always some challenges. So uh, before we go forward with this, I would like to actually introduce you to Alexandra and Carmen Lita. Alexandra, um, she completed her formal training as a registered dietitian nutritionist at University of Arizona and received her master of public health degree from Northern Arizona University. Alexandra comes from the experience of migration, which has driven her passion for health equity research that is community engaged and participatory. Some of her research work has focused on working with Mexican immigrant hotel housekeepers in Flagstaff, Arizona to learn about workers occupational health and safety experiences, and to identify potential policy recommendations. Currently, she's the co-lead organizer of Fairness, Fairness First campaign, and some of her interests include community-based participatory research guided by feminist theoretical models, ra racial and social justice, reproductive health, and the design of nutrition and dietetics programming informed by non-Western critical community-based knowledge. Uh, obviously, a, a, a very well-faceted woman. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And we also have Carmel, Carmelita Chief. She is a chief research coordinator at Northern Arizona University for both the Center of Health Equity Research and the Southwest Health Equity Research Collabor Collaborative in Flagstaff, Arizona. Carmelita is a citizen of the Navajo Nation and grew up in the Navajo chapter community of Cayenta. Is that right? In Arizona, she also holds an MPH, a Master of Public Health, within the Health Behavior and Health Promotion Track from the University of Arizona. Carmen Lita has coordinated research activities for various community-based participatory research projects that have focused on Navajo Nation smoke-free policies, early childhood education, and gastric cancer prevention. Uh, and Carmen Lita is a co-organizer of Fairness First Campaign as well. So we really look forward to your presentation tonight, and I will let you take the stage, and uh, I'll be collecting any questions. I think it's probably best if, um, if you put them in the chat, and I'll keep track of them, and we'll ask them at the, the end. So take it away, Alexandra and Carmen Lita. Thank you very much, Claudia, uh, for that introduction. And Alexandra and I are very excited to be presenting tonight and sharing the work that we have done around um, health communication and talking about health equity research in Northern Arizona. Uh, the, the title of our talk this evening is called The Fairness First Campaign for the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at Northern Arizona University. 
Okay, so I first want to just start off by showing you a slide of where we work at. We work within the Applied Research and Development Building on campus at NAU. It's a lovely building. And next, just to give you a greater view of the campus at NAU, uh, we're nestled up against the the uh, San Francisco Peaks, which in the Navajo language we call Dok Oslid. Um, it is one of our four sacred mountains. And I want to also take this time to share with you our land acknowledgement statement from NAU, which is Northern Arizona University sits at the base of the San Francisco Peaks on homeland sacred to Native Americans th throughout the region. We honor their past, present, and future generations who have lived here for millennia and will forever call this place home. So I do want to share an outline of what you can be expecting from our talk this evening, but if you do have your phone handy, um, I, would, I would ask you to scan that QR code on the right-hand side that will take you straight to our Fairness First campaign website, uh, where you will be able to get more in-depth information about each of the four strategies that we'll be talking about more in detail this evening. First of all, we're going to go over and cover the background of the Fairness First campaign. We're going to share a little bit of our stories and how um, a bit of our lived experiences does inform the formation of the different communication strategies that we have developed as a part of this campaign. And then uh, we will talk a bit about how we are engaging a community engaged lens in communicating about health equity research. And then we'll go ahead and talk and dive more into those four communication strategies, which are the four core components of the Fairness First campaign. And then we'll also go ahead and cover some evaluation feedback that we have received um, thus far from people who have participated in each of these strategies. And then last of all, we will cover um, an overall lessons learned from our development journey of this campaign. Okay, at this point, I do want to pause and let's just see how this goes. Um, I do have two questions for you. So the first part of this question is, we want to get a sense of how many of you in the audience tonight have, have, have you ever been to the Southwest? Okay, I see one hand raised. See if I can check out the chat. Okay, three, three participants out of 10 so far. Um, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, the second part of our question is, what has been, for those of you who have been to the Southwest in the United States, what has been your experience interacting with local communities in the Southwest? And you can go ahead and share that in chat. I don't believe you have the ability to um, speak. I think you can allow them to, we could allow them to talk. Let me see what happens. Allow to talk. Um, I think Dustin Morrison, you can unmute yourself now if you want to. Okay, I see. Alisa is saying no, they can't. Okay. Oh, okay. So I do want to just go ahead and uh, look at who has shared in the chat. Um, some have, have been on family vacations when they were younger um, or have had limited to no interaction at all. So um, thank you for sharing that because that does give us an idea of how we do want to tailor our conversation with you this evening. Um, you know, when, when you are in that situation where you've been to a place, but you haven't really um, had time or the opportunity to um, just really explore locally and talk with local communities. Um, sometimes we do rely on 
stereotypes or maybe um, narratives that have been presented to us across broad mass media. A lot of the times those are not um, accurate representations of the local communities. And um, unfortunately that does help, that does drive um, you know, just the work that we do around health equity, if we are operating on those representations that are depicted to us through media or through other people who, um, who have been to the area, but also have not had that direct interaction. Okay, so let me just read a couple of these. Unless you want to do that, Alexandra, we'll just go back and forth because I I do want to honor those of you who have shared in the comment box. Yes, it sounds like most of you all have visited for vacation. I see Mary Ellen saying visited with my sister in the Tucson area and traveled across Arizona. Um, Dustin Morris says most of my experience in the Southwest has been through travel for vacation. Some engagement, but only that which is typical with vacation travel. Claudia, my niece lives in New Mexico and works in occupational health with local communities. That sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've also done herbal medicine. Oh, yeah, some herbal medicine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for participating and um, letting us know a little bit about you as well and how you been able to interact locally here in our region. So like I said, um, I do want to share a little bit more information about our region and what you see here on the right hand side of the slide is a map of the state of Arizona. And we share this because we do want to share, we do think it is very important to really dive into the spatial, cultural, and even the political context that um, influence health in our region. Like I said, this is a map of the state of Arizona. Uh, what I like about this map is it does outline all of the most, almost all of the 22 uh, tribal nations, indigenous native nations that do have their homelands here in Arizona. Um, at the bottom, you'll see that very thick, dark gray line that represents the U.S.-Mexico border. So um, I will allow Alexandra to share a little bit more about the borderlands, but I'll kick us off with talking a bit about the border town. So for those of you who um, who maybe have grown up near a native uh, nation, reservation, boundaries, um, uh, you know, boundaries that delineate homelands. Um, a lot of folks in indigenous communities refer to places like Flagstaff, which is a very big city in comparison to a lot of the towns that are, uh, that are located in Northern Arizona. Uh, they refer to Flagstaff as a border town because it does sit up against the political boundaries, geographical boundaries of multiple indigenous nations here in the region. Most significantly is the Navajo Nation, which is the largest land-based tribe in the United States. Um, surrounding us here in Flagstaff are also the Hopi Nation, Havasupai, the Wallapai, and the Yavapai Apache. And so, um, you know, just with that, our experience of the border towns is, um, I believe there's some indigenous scholars who, who refer to it as a place of violence, only because, you know, people who are coming up, coming up off the res do encounter experiences of racism and discrimination when traveling into Flagstaff because it, you know, because Flagstaff has so many, um, has a large economic base and it's a place where many families drive into town to get groceries and other necessities that they need for everyday everyday life that might not be um, readily available in their local communities. So I'll turn it over to Alexandra to talk a little bit about the borderlands. Um, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, just keeping in mind that the state of Arizona, it's the border state with um, 
the state of Mexico called Sonora. Um, and so Arizona uh, lives in the national border of <laughs> with Mexico. And so a lot of the communities in Southern Arizona um, are very familiar with what it means to live in the borderlands and border culture. Um, and which folks are really used to, um, for instance, having border patrol, just driving around the city. Um, and so these various um, ways of um, kind of like state violence within the border, which is kind of by dynamic, especially within immigrant communities, um, Latinos who have family members in the US, but also in Mexico, but also indigenous communities who have had to be divided or have had to have their homes divided through a border um, and family members being in Mexico and other family members being in the US territory. So all of these dynamics are really part of the identity that many of the communities in Southern Arizona share. Um, and so just keeping in mind where we're at in terms of context um, of the borderlands. Thank you, Alexandra. And then I do wanna hit on these last two points. So Flagstaff, um, we consider it an island of affluence. So in this greater Northern Arizona region, um, it's comprised mainly of communities that do, do kind of like fall more on the lower socioeconomic side of the this broad spectrum, this broad spectrum of economy. Um, and so uh, we also, Prefer, oh my gosh, refer to it locally as um, a lot of people joke here about it being so expensive. There's a high cost of living. And so um, in order to live here, you have to be of the understanding that you are going to, you know, Flagstaff is poverty with a view. It's just like kind of like a local thing that people joke about. Um, and then lastly, Northern Arizona is very rural. And with that, you know, people have a high dependency and rely a lot on having personal transportation just to go from community to community, but especially from local communities to border towns like Flagstaff. All right, um, and then we do want to share this slide to give you a bit more information about who who exactly is funding the Fair, the Fairness First campaign. Um, Alexandra and I, we both work for the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative. Um, we just got renewed for another five year uh, a five year grant from the National Institutes of Health, and so. Um, the Fairness First campaign is an initiative of SHRC, and it's organized by the Community Engagement Corps. And Alexandra and I both work for um, work as a as a broader team with that core. Um, so there sometimes tends to be a confusion um, between these long names, right? I just talked about what SHRC is. You see it there at the very top, what that stands for. And at the very beginning, we were also identified as working for the Center for Health Equity Research. So you can kind of see them as two sister um, centers at NAU. So for here, from here, we'll go ahead and just pause because our stories, our personal narratives, um, they really drive the creation of the Fairness First campaign. Um, one of our major goals and our major aims is to engage communities into dialogue about health equity and health equity research. But that's not to say that we're coming at these conversations um, totally just like not going beyond examining our power differentials because, because we come from these communities that um, surround Flagstaff, you know, that island of affluence. Um, we come from communities that are directly impacted by a lot of health inequities that research can ex better explore to examine 
um, areas for solution development. But I do want to pause here, like I said, this, to kind of share a little bit about who I am and what my story is. So my name is Carmen Lita Chief, and I normally go by Carm or Carmen. I grew up in a little chapter community called Kayenta, Arizona. It, in its Navajo name, it's called Twodneshe, and a lot of Navajo place names are um, descriptive of the, the, the area, the land. Um, it's either describing some geographical point of interest or something that is very tied to uh, life and living. Um, and survival in the land, in this land. And so Tadnesha means, you know, it describes this place in our community where um, at one point we used to have a spring there and the way that the water used to move down in that spring, it looked like little fingers, like fringes. And so Tadnesha just means uh, water that moves in fringes. And so, um, I grew up pretty much, I was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. I was immersed in daily in my, in my Diné culture. Uh, Diné is our traditional name for Navajo. So we used, we tend to use that interchangeably. So I was immersed in Diné culture. I heard um, Navajo on a daily basis, but because of the complex historical experiences that my parents had, um, they were of the boarding school generation, which means that they were forcibly, um, they were forcibly what, what compelled or they were forcibly um, told that they needed to go to these assimilation schools that were funded by the US government. Uh, some of these are still in operation today, although now tribes um, have more control over the, edu the education of their students that go to these federally funded boarding schools. But back in the day, it was pretty harsh. Um, there was lots of stories of violence, of um, punishment for speaking the language. Um, so these schools were really basically like factories for assimilating Navajo kids, Native kids into um, the, the, the American society and also to help train them so that they could become workers, like lower class workers in American society. So that's a little bit about my background. I talked a bit about my family. And so I did bring up that history of the boarding school because it was for that reason, my mom said, I wanted you to have a leg up when you go to school. So therefore I'm not gonna teach you Navajo. So although I heard it every day, I can understand um, Navajo when it's spoken to me, but I myself have a very hard time um, in conversational Navajo myself. It's a very hard language. So with that, um, I moved off the res for a bit to pursue college and university studies. Um, eventually, I ended up here at NAU after getting my MPH degree from the U of A. And now um, I pretty much hold this role of, of being a very strong advocate for urban indigenous health here in Flagstaff. And I also just wanted to quickly share that I've always had a lifelong interest in the arts, communication, and storytelling. If some of you out there are very much interested in Meyer, Myers-Briggs personality tests, um, I, I am an INFP. So I'm an introvert, I'm very like empathetic as well. So I think that kind of ties hand in hand with my interest in the way that we communicate our tone, visual communication, the colors that we use images to tell stories. And so I think that's where my, my personal interest really um, provides a strength in the development of this campaign. So I'll hand it over to Alexandra to share a bit about where she's coming from and how she has used those experiences to contribute to the development of this campaign. Thank you, Carm. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so um, my name is Alexandra. And uh, so personally, I come from an experience of immigration. I came to the US with my mom uh, when I was 16. Um, 
was raised by a single mom, very strong woman. And so I've always been or learned to be very reliant. And I had lived undocumented in the US for some time. And so that previous experience of quote unquote undocumentedness, if you wanna call it, uh, really pushed me into community organizing <clears throat> in the state of Arizona that's focused on immigrant rights, um, also supporting immigrant low-wage workers in uh, collective advocacy efforts within the workplace. And so all of these experiences of community organizing really led me to um, discover what is community-engaged research and the role of research in mobilizing communities, um, mobilizing communities so that we could find solutions that come from the ground up to support um, communities' health. And I really grew a passion for, um, sorry, my chihuahua, this is the, this is, <laughs> this is what happens when you do Zoom sessions. Um, so you might be seeing my chihuahua around, <laughs> floating around. But um, all of that to say that I am a very community grounded individual. Um, I super passionate about community engaged research, especially research that uses non-Western ways of knowing and creating knowledge, especially feminist epistemologies that have been, I believe, very useful in informing research or the way we understand the knowledge from communities and thinking about actions that are tangible in supporting communities' health. And so all of these lived experiences and, and kind of different perspectives that Carmen and I had, we were able to merge them and really understand how can we communicate or create a bridge of communication between how health equity researchers understand health equity and then how community leaders are also conceptualizing health equity because it looks very different. And so that is how the Fairness First campaign was, kind, was born basically. Thank you, Alexandra. So with that, we'll move on. You know, thank you for indulging us and talking a little bit about ourselves. Um, as we proceed forward, you'll actually see how important that is because some of the researchers that we speak with um, that we're trying to mentor into talking, how to talk with community, um, they're still very new to even talking about who they are, uh, what their background is because that background and very much informs like how we communicate with people, how we see these issues of inequity that are facing communities. So, um, and on the other side, communities also, um, particularly indigenous communities have had a history of just, you know, development of mistrust against academic institutions for do, coming in, doing helicopter research, and then going back out. And a lot of these communities are left without um, any updates on what happened with the data that they shared or the samples that they shared. And so um, because of that, um, some communities have become really worried. And at this point, people want to know who you are when you're coming from a university institution and, you know, why this why this issue matters to you and how are you going to be collaborating um, effectively and harmoniously within the within their cultural context to um, put put the research forward or move the research forward. So when we talk about using a community engaged lens, what we're what we want to what we thought was most important to touch on in development of this campaign, the Fairness First campaign, was one just really recognizing that the existence of this power differential that exists between the the institution itself and the communities. Um, in which the institution is wanting to partner or collaborate to do research with. 
Um, and then also power differentials between academic folks, principal investigators and research staff and students um, in relation to community leaders and community, um, community members. So we wanted to make sure that we, re we, we reg readily recognize that, but we also acted on that in a way that we um, wanted to create a welcoming space for community members when we hosted some of these events or when we produced um, verbal, not verbal, but we're in communication tools such as blogs. We wanted to make sure that we were using in, re, using verbiage and using language that was community friendly um, and, and didn't um, contribute to this gatekeeping of information that tends to happen uh, when academic, academics or institutions try to do community outreach to communities. And then, um, and then second of all, we wanted to make sure that when we are developing each of these strategies, how are we being innovative and how are we being grounded in community speak and community um, communication modes that really honor how how, how information is shared and also how information is provided back from the community. We wanted to do this in a way that bridged that understanding to one, help the researchers kind of cultivate that, um, the practice of talking about themselves, talking about their research, but doing it in a manner that where they were also actively listening to the needs of the community and really trying to um, alter their, their communication, their speak, their verbiage, to match or at least complement um, what the community is needing and how they receive information and how they want to receive that information. So at this point, um, we do want to pause and just ask another, throw another question out there. So in your own words, what is health equity? How would you define health equity? in the easiest way possible. So oftentimes we do ask our researchers, um, define health equity as if you're trying to tell your mom or to tell your grandma, somebody in your family about what it is that you do. What is health equity in your own words? Okay, so Claudia actually uh, DM'd me instead of sharing with everybody, but she did say a level playing field for healthcare. And then Janet just said equal access to health systems and services. Yeah, I also see um, someone messaging the Q&A um, box. Yeah. Can you see that? It says when everyone gets what they need to be healthy, especially for communities that have specific issues addressed that affect them. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, so we'll let you think a bit more on that. So that was pretty much our task when we were developing these strategies is how do we talk about health equity in a way that is going to um, garner the interest of communities to talk about this? It's not a term or it's not a concept that was born in an academic space because we recognize we come from these communities that, that have their own knowledge systems very intricate knowledge systems for a lot of indigenous communities. They are um, millennia old. And so uh, we have developed, we, we have our un own understanding of what health equity means in our own languages. And so our task was really um, to dive back into our personal experiences, our knowledge of the communities, and trying to find ways of how we could best kind of marry what we learn in academic settings in our Western education, but also um, marry, marrying that with local knowledge systems and how they talk about um, inequity, uh, imbalance, disharmony, 
um, all of those things that rep represent um, a barrier to living our best lives, right? Okay, so let me just breeze through this quickly. Um, a little bit more about the Fairness First campaign. Uh, we did develop it back in the fall of 2021, and we just wrapped up our last event of this of the year uh, this past August. Our intended audiences are twofold. So on the one hand, we do want to engage health equity researchers, but on the other, we also want to engage community leaders and also aspiring leaders and regular everyday community members. So the overall purpose of developing this campaign, our vision for this was, again, we wanted to create a welcoming space or spaces, and that's inclusive of the online virtual space that is housed on our website. Uh, these spaces, we wanted them to be for co-learning where both researchers and non-academic community, community members could ex exchange um, knowledge and opinions about health equity topics and also um, know that they could access tools for that might be helpful for, um, for exploring future collaborative health equity research. Oh. Let me go back really quick, just to give you a preview. So like I said, there's four core strategies that make up the campaign. One of them is the Fairness First X Talk. Uh, the other one is the Health Justice Futures virtual conversation series that really um, involves art and literature. And then we do have a Fairness First podcast. And then to round it all out, we have a Fairness First blog. So I'll go ahead and talk a bit about two strategies, and then I'll hand it over to Alexandra to close us out. But um, I have the pro I have the pleasure of talking about the Fairness First X Talks. And on the left hand side, you see a flyer that we've developed when we are doing our marketing for these events that we hold. Uh, they're bi-monthly, although this past year has been a challenge to commit to that schedule. So uh, we tried really hard to keep it bi-monthly, but sometimes, you know, life happens, things happen at the last minute. So we weren't we weren't exactly um, that committed to that bi-monthly schedule. But the Fairness First X Talks or the FFX um, talk is modeled after the popular TEDx Talks program. And what we really wanted to center on was giving, giving uh, researchers the ability to really put into practice talking about themselves or you know, talking about their positionality and also talking about their, their work in a way that um, really complemented the storytelling method of sharing information. The storytelling method is very, um, very integral to a lot of indigenous communities and in the way that they share information and, and that they share knowledge. So this was really a way to kind of dismantle the academic brown bag type talks that where you feel like sometimes you're, you're being talked at rather than having a conversation with somebody about who they are and what their work is. So the, the, the impetus of this talk really came from my own experiences. So when I'm in my Navajo community, when you meet somebody for the first time, we always share our clans, our kinship clans, that tells us how we are related to one another and how we should be greeting one another. Uh, people always want to know, where are you from? Who are your parents? Who are your grandparents? Um, and, and why did you come to visit here today? So in a way, we did want to model the Fairness First talks after that, where we coached these researchers into talking about who they are as a human being, because we wanted to elevate these talks into kind of like a human to human conversation about a topic that impacts um, a particular population, but also globally or like on a broader spectrum, how does that impact us all? Because a lot of these issues are tied together. They're not isolated. And so how do we how do we all relate to these topics, even if we're not directly impacted by them? Oh, 
Okay. And then I want to share two parts of our, our evaluation because, of course, you know, evaluation is very important. It tells us what we did right, what we did successfully, but also it also identifies areas of improvement and how can we better put these, um, put these events on in the future. So as you can see here, um, these look very good, right? 50%, 100%, so 50%. Um, of participants who did attend our first talk, first and second talks, felt that, felt like they were inspired to look more into possible community partnerships or collaborations, 100% wanted to learn more about engaging community in research, and then 100% felt, felt like the talk sparked new perspectives about advancing health equity. But you can see here, we only had four respondents from each of those two um, those uh, FFX talks that we initially had. So we had a lot of work that we needed to do as far as um, engaging people to give us feedback. So this looks really good, but of course we only had four respondents. And so as you can see from this meme, we have much to learn and uh, we, we all still, much to learn we all still have according to Yoda. But I'm very happy to report by the time that we finally got into our flow, we're like, okay, we know how to do this. We know basically um, what people respond to and what people don't necessarily feel like uh, they, they feel like is necessary as part of these talks. Um, we had our largest turnout from our third event after we've had a lot to learn. And you can see there that um, people were just, you know, giving praises on this third talk that focused on on um, postpartum care for um, Indigenous and Latinx mothers here in Northern Arizona. And so you can see there that 100% felt like they could approach the speaker of the series more about the topic. They felt comfortable in, in engaging more about a research conversation on the topic. They also felt like they um, had a better understanding of the role of research in advancing health equity. And about 88% said that they had planned to use the information that they had learned that day uh, to carry it on forward in their studies and in their work. And you can see that the lessons that we learned from this is researchers need coaching about building confidence. And, you know, from somebody who is not a principal investigator um, who has yet to get go on and get a PhD, sometimes you do feel like, oh, like, you know, you, you understand these power differentials at work and you feel like researchers who have a PhD should know it all, or they probably already know how to talk to people or talk about themselves. But we learned through this series that that was not the case, that we do have something to give as far as um, project coordinators, research coordinators, and we can still um, help mentor and, and coach these researchers into better um, increasing their positionality practices when they're talking to communities about the research that they do. And then um, second of all, we did understand that our, our team needed to provide a little bit more technical assistance to the researchers in order to enhance um, the visual aspect of communicating their research to communities, because that's important too. And then um, second of all, the blog. So a lot of you might be familiar with what a blog is. It's basically uh, very, very much web-based. Um, we created this because we understand that, you know, when you have a researcher coming into a community, you kind of want to know, like, you Google them, right? You, you get out your phone, you're like, okay, Dr. Naomi Lee came to our community today. She was talking about the work that she's doing around HPV, HPV vaccines, but I'm going to learn a little bit more about her. So this strategy was all about at least providing a little bit more community friendly um, content that would be available on the internet that folks could quickly Google this person and, and this would show up in the first um, section of the search results. And so it's really a journal type space where we ask our different SHRC funded researchers 
seven standard questions. And here's an example of one of those questions that we ask. This one says, how do you want your research to make a difference or change in this world? And so we do ask all of our researchers, please keep it short and very simple, um, no more than 150 words. And the, the goal of this blog, these blog posts, is to make sure that they could be read within about three to four minute span. So we try our best to also be community friendly in that way. So this, just, this graph here just kind of shows you, um, maybe I'll give you an example of this teal one. So our first blog post was published October of 2021. And so you'll kind of see on down the line how it did um, kind of slowed down in November, December, but started to pick back up in January. So we we're able to track the popularity of these um, blogs. Um, we're also able to kind of track how well we did with marketing, what's working. So this just kind of gives you an idea of how well each of those different blog posts did. So some of the lessons that we've learned through this journey is one, if you plan to do this in the future, um, please understand that these researchers are very busy. And I, and I know that you probably know that as students trying to get a hold of your professors sometimes, super busy. So we just say that give, give them ample time in advance to submit their answers and expect to do a lot of follow-up. Eventually they will give you the answers, but it does sometimes take that bugging to do. And then I think what's important again is also that, that co-learning that needs to occur for researchers because they also need to know like how to break down um, language around the work that they're doing to make sure what they're saying is more community friendly. And then um, last of all, I'm getting a signal from Claudia. So I'm gonna start wrapping it up, wrapping it up soon. And then last of all, the Q&A format. Um, it was pretty simple out of all of the different four strategies that we did. I think the blog took significant less time to develop and it's been successful in my eyes. So from here, I'm going to hand it over to Alexandra. Karen, would you skip that slide? Sure. So now I'll just um, touch briefly. Yeah, the slides got, I'm so sorry, you all. It's hard to see everything they got a little cut out. But anyways, uh, I'm just going to summarize the, summarize the two um, strategies, but get to the lessons learned of this campaign. But the Health Justice Futures events, like Carm said before, these are art and lit mixers. The majority of them happen online. We finalized with an in-person drag show um, where we engaged community members in imagining what health systems can look like for um, two-spirit and trans and queer communities in Northern Arizona. So the can you go to the next slide? So the biggest thing to keep in mind about these Health Justice Futures events is that we really wanted to engage um, community grounded artists who also were considered leaders in their communities. For us, prioritizing the active participation of artists was critical so that we could understand how communities document health inequity and even think about health and different structural issues that impact their well-being. So that was our major kind of highlight for these health justice futures, basically building close relationships with community engaged artists. So if you go to the next slide, Carm. And then I really encouraged you, highly encouraged you to please find our podcast in any preferred podcast app that you have. Um, we, the two most popular segments are What is Health Equity Anyway, which is an episode about really interviewing different people in the community and unpacking what health equity is. And then we have another episode called the Health Equity Chit Chat, where we engage the critical scholarship of queer and other feminists of color. Um, 
and understanding how critical scholarship can inform the design and implementation of health equity research. Um, producing a podcast takes a lot of work. So a big lesson here was that we were a very small team and we are taking a pause on the podcast, but we do recognize it as an effective way to disseminate uh, research related content. And then the next slide. So overall lessons learned about this campaign, what went well, we provided mentorship to health equity researchers. We built strong relationships with community grounded artists. We created a place where we could unpack in very easy communication what health equity is and what, um, what is the research that's going on at SHRC. Um, and we exceeded the expectation. We, at first, the expectation, expectation was to plan health equity related webinars, but we ended up engaging all these different modes of communication. And to end, um, I'll just wanna touch on what we needed to improve. So the next slide. Um, we, we really needed to expand who we partnered with in terms of the communication outlets, because we, we needed to do some more work in reaching out non-academic community audiences. And so really partnering with local media outlets to better promote our strategies. And then assess the team capacity. Again, some of these communication strategies took a lot of work. We were a very small team. And so really understanding realistically what is it that we can do and then finding cohesion within other shirt cores. We're part of the community engagement core. And there are other cores that might be doing similar efforts. So we just need to better partner within our cores. And finally, reassess our focus of engagement. We needed to be very intentional and specific about the communities we were engaging um, so that we could better promote and engage communities beyond NAU. So I know we're kind of <laughs> we're moving into question uh, Q and A now, but thank you all for listening to us. This is the rest of our team, and if you have any questions, um, we can put our emails in the chat. Um, but I believe now we open it up for some questions. That was so wonderful. Uh, and we have, uh, well, we have a comment. If anybody has any questions, please do put them in the chat. I um, I did want to say that uh, Chris had put something in there that uh, said that thank that's thanking you for reminding uh, us all about the value of telling our stories before engaging in the work with others. And uh, I have to say, I was so impressed that you did uh, community-friendly coaching um, sessions with the researchers before you sent them out, before they went out in the field, because I think it's so key. <laughs> um, but there's also uh, another question um, from Chris. Um, you noted earlier that you are working with several different Native American communities and they, exper and they experience both common and different factors that impact their lived experiences and relative degree of health equity. How did you bridge these differences in the community grounded conversations? Um, that's a really good question. So the approach that um, we took was we're looking at what are the common values, the common um, aspects of their, you know, the, the lenses through which they're looking at these um, health, these issues of health, uh, oh my gosh, health inequities. And so um, we, so because I already have that inherent understanding of you know, um, how, what Hopi is experiencing, how Wallapai are looking at these different issues, I'm able to kind of pinpoint what are the, the common threads. And so we kind of just run with that. 
I'm I'm curious, you know, you were talking about um, communication strategies and you feel like you need to kind of, um, you know, do a little bit better job there. What kind of strategies did you use and did did you encourage uh, people to be using not only storytelling, but you talk about visual works by artists or or dance? What what other things were you using? Yeah, I think that where we really highlighted um, the differences in how communities communicate and create knowledge was engaging in the Health Justice Futures events because we really gave community artists the freedom to express um, however they wanted to. <laughs> So we had artists who used creative writing and talked about how creative creative writing allowed them to really conceptualize what was going on in their own lives and the lives in, of their communities, but also create new models of knowledge. Um, we had a lot of visual artists. And then our last event, we had a drag, drag artist who, um, her name is Lady Shug. She's very involved in indigenous trans um, health related efforts um, in Northern Arizona and New Mexico. And her performance was, even though it was a drag performance, um, she's so talented at telling a story through the arts of um, performance and lip singing. Um, related to the struggles of two-spirit trans communities in Northern Arizona. And so, um, and we have recordings of those sessions in our website. I would say those were the most fulfilling and creative ways for us in which we learned how different communities are actually making sense of their own realities, but also the inequities they're experiencing and witnessing. That's great. I, I love I loved her earrings. I I, ne I immediately <laughs> noticed that when when you were showing her. But it's just an interesting way to kind of get the message across. You know, um, there is uh, there's a couple more questions uh, that we certainly have time for. Um, so, uh, can you provide some advice for first steps to build trust with communities before starting a research project? That's a that's a really key one. Um, I could I could go first and Alexandra, if there's something you want to provide. So for me, I always tell people like, and I think we all kind of start, we understand that you need to provide time um, aside from your studies, aside from the work that you do to just show up as a low, as another human being, as another community member, whether that is going to a local market kind of talking with people, you know, seeing what they eat, eating with them, um, going to different markets, things of that nature. Indigenous communities have different, like, um, some ceremonies that are open to the public, um, social gatherings. So I would just say invest the time in going, in going to those things. It will take time. I mean, you know, I'm interested, did you get any pushback uh, when you were doing pilot programs? Because I think that often people get, you know, they get involved in the pilot programs and then they are for, they're often for, you know, a, sh a fairly short duration uh, and, and then they leave again. Did, did you have any problems with that or any pushback around that? Um, no, not necessarily. And I think our strength here is um, we're both brown women. And so a yeah. lot of these communities and uh, that we are engaging in these conversations, they're, they're also, um, they see us as an extension of somebody who comes from these communities. So I think that trust is already, there's a little bit more trust that is evident there than it would be with somebody who looks like they're not from the, those communities. Right. Yeah. And uh, I just want to add add to that because I also want to be mindful that even though Carmen and I might have ties to communities that might be 
targeted for health equity research. Um, we, we have capital, we are representing an academic institution. And so we still need to put in labor to build that trust. I think the trust comes from long time of community engagement for me and CARM that people know us and see our faces as familiar faces. But now that we're in this position of research, being researchers and being part of this academic space, I, me personally, I do experience that I need to be more tactful. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and then another thing in terms of advice for first steps in building trust, something that I was reminded when we were coaching a lot of the health equity researchers, um, I remember one of them saying like, you know, I've never been asked to talk about myself in a presentation. And then I, Carmen, I thought, oh my God, that's crazy. You've been doing this for years and you've never really shared anything about yourself when you talk about your work. So then we realized how needed it is for researchers to kind of break that wall of the expert and the non-expert or the other, but actually coming in as this is who I am, this is my background, and this is why I am even interested in this particular issue. Um, so feeling yeah, comfortable I think that's key. talking about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's one last question. We're out of time, but there's one last question that I want to get in because uh, I, you know, I, I, I. This is one question I wanted to ask. Um, did you involve local herbalists or medicine people in your podcasts or blogs as a way to highlight indigenous health knowledge, or was that even necessary? I I would have loved to have done that, um, but first and foremost, because one of our tasks is to highlight the research that SHRC has funded, um, we do put the spotlight on the SHRC funded researchers, um, but through the podcast, we've been able to explore different, uh, more community grounded discussions, so that could Definitely be um, something that we do in the future if we decide to revive the podcast. But like Alexandra said, it does involve a lot of time and a lot of labor. So at the moment, it's on pause. And sometimes you have to go where your grant wants you to go. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. We're we're at time now, but thank you so much. Uh, we I think we've really, I know we've really enjoyed this. Um, Chris says thank you so much for sharing personal stories, work, and wisdom with us all. Um, and uh, thank you. I lived, uh, I think uh, I learned a lot. It says loot, but I think that's a lot. <laughs> so thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. And uh, we hope that we can have some collaboration going forward. And, um, and so I'll say good night to you. Thank you all thank for you. having us.